Hello, this is Dani Ross from Human Connection. Today we're going to talk to a young lady. She had to go through a very, very hard trauma. She found out when she was 24 years old that her father had been murdered. It was so difficult, but she went through huge struggle and traumas and today she's going to explain us with her heart all what she had to go through and how she came out so strong. So her name is Natalie Ituriaga. I'm going to introduce you to Natalie. Hi Natalie. Hello Dani. So happy you, you accept my invitation because um, when I met you before, I was very touched and moved by your story. So, tell us your story from your childhood. From my childhood, well, I was born here in Montreal, in Canada, uh, many decades ago, um, to a Chilean family. My parents and my sisters had arrived here in 1975, escaping the dictatorship from Chile, the Pinochet's dictatorship. Uh, my father had been a political prisoner for six months under that dictatorship. So they fled Chile. I was born here two years later. I had a very happy childhood. Um, my father was a pastor. Uh, he was also very involved in the community. So I was always um, very much growing up with uh, people from our community, the Latino community, children, no problems whatsoever. Um, obviously some hiccups here and there, but I had a very happy childhood. So, um, so you had a very happy childhood and uh... I'm sure there was always a lot of people in the house and yes uh, yeah always so very happy so tell us what happened later uh the first it's interesting because i wouldn't i wouldn't have called it trauma until rather recently but when i was about 21 years old i was diagnosed with premature menopause mm -hmm. uh, which means that i couldn't have children oh. and so as many little girls or young ladies, um, and even women in general, always want to be mothers. They want, part of their definition of womanhood is to have children in our society, uh, it, although it is changing. But for me, I always wanted to be a mom. And not being able to have children definitely was, uh, was very difficult. And now in hindsight, I can see that I already was demonstrating the same coping mechanisms. I later on showed the my father's murder. Okay, so how old were you when your dad was murdered? I was 24. So tell us how, what happened, how did it happen? Um, my father was an immigration consultant at that time and he was also a pastor and um, he represented refugees in front of the immigration board. Um, he was very involved in the community, so anyone from Latin America most, most of the time. And he had an appointment with a client that evening, it was a Tuesday and he was supposed to be home for seven. He wasn't answering the phone, hours kept on passing. Finally, my mother, one of my sisters, decided to uh, go to his office to see if he was fine. I stayed home just in case he showed up. And um, uh, I was on the phone with them when they discovered him. They went into the office and he was uh, lying on the floor in his blood. So um, those moments, those immediate moments of hearing the screams <clears throat> on the phone, then not knowing uh, what happened before, and not realizing that he was dead either at that moment. So when the police arrived, they separated my mom and my sister in different um, police vehicles. And I was left alone at home, mm -hmm. not knowing. That's the worst. Um, until so finally, um, I was, on, I think it was, I don't even remember who had the phone, but one of them had the phone. And I kept asking them, why hasn't the ambulance taken him away? Yeah. Um, it's only afterwards that you realize if the ambulance doesn't leave, it's because the person is dead but I wasn't understanding and I was screaming, why hasn't the ambulance taken him away? Um, they both knew he was dead. I didn't realize it. So it's a I mean, I mean, your mom, she knew, but she didn't want to tell you. On the she was in shock as well. So they, she found, she, my sister stayed at the door, but they saw the blood. Obviously my mother went to him and she's the one who had to see him. They, he was hit uh, over the head several times. Um, so she's the one who clearly knew he was dead. Um, and finally, they took both my mother and sister to the police station to question them. And I kept on calling so much. I was, in, I was bothering the interrogation, so the police officer, a female police officer, took the phone 
and she told me rather dryly that my father was dead. Oh. So um, it was very difficult. So at that time, what what do you feel? It's like it's like the end of the world. It's like you don't believe it. Huh? Is there a problem? The first thing that it? came to mind was if I call my father's cell phone, he won't answer. That was the first thing that crossed my mind. I remember I felt my knees. And I don't know if I cried or if I, I think I cried. Um, thankfully, I had called one of my closest friends, uh, Claudia. She was working that evening, and but her parents came over and her mom stayed with me. So she was there uh, with me um, to keep me company, to hold me as I cried. I, I, it's very, um, it's very blank. I don't remember much of it. Yeah, because sometimes when the pain is uh, too strong, uh, uh, the brain, there is like a shortage of brain. It just, mm. it just, uh, I went through that and then you just it cut out just to protect you. Yeah. Because it's too painful. Yeah. So, but they never find the Wukri then. No, after three That's years, worst. it became, they had to close the case. It was a cold case. It, it still is a cold case. So there's, um, there's never been any good leads. They have only found one partial fingerprint. Um, but it, or the person's not in the database or wasn't good enough for them to find anything, but that was in 2002 to 2005. So there's so many new things that have happened with technology. So I'm hoping that yeah, at some point, some lead can happen, can come along so they can reopen the case. So do you still have hope that one day? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It could have been, um, could have been even a client. I mean, it was... Well, yeah, uh, definitely. My father would not have just gone if it wasn't for, for him having to meet someone. So they, the police did think it was two people, one person in front of him and one that stood up maybe to go next to him to show him something. Because my father was a big man. He was tall. He was, he was strong. There was no yeah. way he would have just let himself be hit over the head. So maybe he knew things that, as you said, because he worked with refugee or political... Anyway, let's not go there. It's not our work. So how did you... Um, how did you do to, with all this huge, huge pain, how did you do to, uh, to help yourself? I mean, did you, what was your reaction after to, to save yourself from all that? The first reaction was to work, um, to be very stoic, um, to not be connected with my feelings, mm -hmm. to not want to cry, to try to cry alone in my bed. I was still living at home, so I didn't want to be a burden to anyone. Uh -huh. um, so when my mom would come see me and she asked me like, Amorcito, what's happening? I'm like, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And so just, I, I felt like I needed to be strong. And for your mother maybe? For my mother, for everyone. But I guess now in looking back, it was for myself. It was for me, it was for me. How was your mom reacting after that? A little bit like me, actually. Yeah. She's also like that. Very strong. Yeah. Strong. She didn't want, she, no, she didn't. She couldn't cry in front of us. Yeah. So we actually sent her, we shipped her off to Chile to see her sisters, thinking that maybe she would cry with her sisters. Okay. But she wouldn't cry with them either. So she probably cried in her own bed, like I did. Yeah. Okay. I understand. So you started working like crazy just to forget all this. Uh... Always easier to just fill in those, that pain with something else. So I. Okay. I was in university. I was. I had a full course loaded. I was working part time at Club Monaco, which is where I met you. Yeah. Um, and then I couldn't. I couldn't handle the the course load. No. I then I went down to two courses with my favorite professors, and even that I couldn't handle. So I put that aside and never fully went back to it. Um, started working. They offered me at Club Monaco a management position, which I said yes to. Also, I felt like I needed to help at home a bit more. So. That's it. I became, started working as a manager at Club Monaco, and I didn't look back. Uh, when I was about 27, I think, 26, 27, they, I got promoted to district manager, but it had to be in Alberta. Ooh. And so I said, yes, no problem, because once again, I had to run away from it. Yeah, you I thought fun. it was, oh, it's a great promotion, and it was good, but yeah. it was classic running away, um, way of coping with my issues, and again, in, through therapy, I was able to understand that what I had was PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So post-traumatic stress. Yeah. 
But uh, how long did you stay in America? Three years. Oh, three years. Did you feel lonely there because you had no friends, no family? Yes and no, because it, it was satisfying that I was working. This is what I wanted. And I was working 70, 80 hours because the head office for New York, for La Monica, or Ralph Lauren, is in New York. So my day started at 6 because their offices started at 8. So I was, my day was full. Um, so, and I even had to be working sometimes during the weekends. I had five stores and I was always working, working, working. My teams did really well. I turned that district around. Um, so it was great. You were the perfect, actually you were the perfect employee for this company. Yeah, if you're, if you're stressed and, you know, trying to yes, yes, forget yes. your problems, you'll get promoted possibly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. Because, because at that time you did not have a personal life and you didn't no. want to be faced with yourself, you didn't want to look at all this Absolutely. pain. So Absolutely. some people do it with work, with drugs, with uh, whatever, sex. Absolutely. Or, so um, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you come back from Alberta. Yeah. Uh, happy to be back in Montreal. Yes, yes, because at that point, I think that distance, which I thought was my prescription, was distance, was going to be enough, and it wasn't. I already started missing my family, obviously, that I did see from time to time, my friends, I needed to reconnect, okay. and so I came back to Montreal with La Monica as well, but so goes life. Uh, there was a restructuring of a company, my position was abolished, uh, they gave me a severance package, so I was forced by life to not work. Okay. It was the first time where life was like, oh, mm-mm. So it, I had to stop working, but before I stopped with La Monica, my boss at the time came from Toronto to visit me to say goodbye. And she was, uh, she knew the director, for, the game director for Apple, which is my current employer. And so even before I left La Monaco, I already had a foot into Apple. So I never quite left um, okay. work, but surprisingly, surprising myself, I actually, Apple gave me the offer. I had several uh, interviews. They wanted me to start right away. And I said, actually, no, because I'm going to Italy with my mom and my sister. And they're like, oh, well, it's Apple, we need to say yes. And I'm like, well, if you really want me, you will wait for me. And they did. Wow. And they did. And so I, I, that's when I think that somewhat of a, I wouldn't say healing, but, you know, I, I knew something, I needed to care of myself. And I became a little bit more self-aware. And you had, I, I, from what I, I understood, at that time you said no. It, it was showing like you were starting to have respect for yourself yes. because you had boundaries. Yes. You were able to say no to big job, yeah. you know? I mean, you were taking the risk. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the beginning of a healing. It's when you start loving yourself, respecting yourself. Absolutely. D during all that time, did you went through therapy and all that? No. No. No therapy. No, no therapy. therapy. Wow, so you go to Italy, which was fun to be to connect again with your family. You, you go back, you work at Mac, and... Uh... And then working through Apple, it was great. I've been there for 11 years, but years. Um, like any, any person who starts a new job, you want to, you want to impress. Of course. Uh, we have a saying in Spanish, every new broom wants to sweep well. Tout nouveau balai veut bien balayer. Yes, so, yes. Um, of course, it's like a new relationship. I, I'm like, I was a you know, great room. The best. <laughs> yes, 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 great room. Yes, yes. So give me more, no problem. <laughs> oh, you need to work a bit more, no problem. And it's a fun job. It's a yeah. great job. It's very dynamic. Yes. Uh, great people. Yes, yes. All the great ingredients to make you want to work more as exactly. well. Exactly. Um, but, you know, you as you get older, you realize that you're carrying weight. You start wondering why is my back, if you want, yeah. hurting so much. And that's realizing, whew, I, my coping mechanisms weren't as good anymore. And I started seeing people around me within our team uh, having panic attacks. And I was started putting a name to what it was that I was feeling because it was happening to me too, but I didn't know what it was. I'm like, oh, maybe it's my heart, ah, whatever. I'm just going to try to go to bed earlier today. You didn't want to listen to your body. No, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a name for it either. Okay. So when I started seeing some of our staff, go through panic attacks and name it a panic attack. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's when I had to put pause a little bit and be like, okay, so this is something that may be happening to me. But I was once again in denial until, until March 2018 when my body, once again, my mind, my body just said, 
enough basta um, a lot was happening at work I was taking care of certain situations that was that were pretty heavy um, involving one of our employees and um, I don't know I guess I was just the drop that just made the glass so what did it happen you went through like it yeah I was at work and I think I was on my break and I started crying in the office which I'm not a crier really um, and I couldn't even think of having to put my t-shirt on my Apple t-shirt on and go back to the floor where I knew it was going to be super busy where I knew I had to put my my mask back on yes of like everything's fine I'm on stage and have to absorb everyone's issues be the sounding board for everyone when I couldn't be that for myself and I just started crying and one of my my boss, one of the big boss came into the office and he's the one who found me crying. He didn't know what to do with me because I'm not a crier. And uh, basically he's like, do whatever you need to do, go, take care of yourself. And I went to see the doctor and in that condition that I was in, it was pretty obvious that I was having a, a, a breakdown. Major burnout. Major burnout, yeah. And uh, yeah. So the doctor gave you a leave of absence for how long? Uh, gave me a leave of absence. I don't remember how long it was for at first. It was let's see a couple of maybe two months or three months. I think yeah I don't remember all of it. I remember that I slept for the first two weeks pretty much non-stop So you um, totally, yeah, yeah, and uh, then you have face to you have time to think Yes, and feed not only think because if it's think it's not here then you have time to really to listen to your reading and, and, and you felt like you were not okay. Yeah, I didn't have a choice but to, to look at myself in the mirror yeah. um, and confront myself and confront myself, the perception or the image I had of myself with the true me. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully I did um, get help therapy with oh, a psychologist that, time, yeah. that I, was, I saw on a weekly basis. I saw my doctor and my, my psychologist quite often. Um, it's, it's interesting that from the very beginning, I wanted to help myself. Well, maybe not the beginning. In the beginning, I was just, I was flatlined basically, but very quickly it was accepting that I need to take antidepressant, accepting that I to take a sleeping pill because I wasn't, after sleeping two weeks, almost straight, I wasn't sleeping anymore. <laughs> accepting that I had to do it because uh, culturally speaking, uh, the Latin American community as a whole, maybe I'm generalizing, we're not big on psychologists and, no. and medicine. It's when for it comes rich to, people. Right? It is for rich people. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I had to break that down. And I've always been good at standing up for myself. And I think the fact that my mother wasn't very keen on me taking that, that kind of like triggered me to be like, no, I need this. I need this for me. Okay. And so I had to reclaim myself. And then it was, how do I help myself? And so accepting that I needed the help, um, it was a hard it was a hard path because I wasn't used to speaking about my issues very much, no. especially something so deep yeah. when I couldn't put a name to it. Yeah. Um, you were losing control. I was losing control, and that's the best. I was. That's I what lost we have, control. That's what we have to do. Uh, we we always have to go through a huge down whatever it yeah. is, lose control, and find out that. We think with much, we're not, we strong, but not through our ego. I can't hold on, I can't hold on. And yeah. when you don't want to listen, your body say, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what happened. Absolutely. But I was strong before, but it was, it was just, and I was talking about a mask. It was a it mask. It was the ego. It was my ego. Yeah. But because I know that now after the burnout and after everything I've gone through, uh, I'm much stronger. Of course. And by talking about it, I'm very strong because I can talk about it. Exactly. So, um, it, it's brought me closer to people. It's brought me, it's brought me a lot of vulnerability, oh, humility. humility. So good. Yeah. So good. It, it sounds, when you don't go through that, it sounds terrible. What? You meant vulnerability. And because I've been through that, so I know. Mm. And, and, and after, as you say, but you say a very strong point. It brings you more with people, but the right people. Yes. You don't lose yourself. No. If we're outside. You don't. You don't try to be a pleaser anymore. No. <laughs> you just go with the right people you connect with. So how long did you you stop for two years? Huh? You said I stopped for two years, but 
I tried to go back to work and it didn't work. Okay. But I did all in all two years and then eventually okay. I was able to go back. I was, I was ready. So you learn a lot, and and uh, tell us because I think now in uh, we we are we going through a time now like all these young people like you're still young you know like uh, thank you <laughs> even younger than you but how, why are so many people working in company I mean we everywhere are suffering from burnout stress everything you you work with a lot of people in this company Apple of course so. Would you have a message to leave them? Or because you talk to a lot and I'm sure you help them. So what message would you leave to these people? I would say several things. One of them would be to let others help you and to be true to yourself and to accept what you see in the mirror and that what you see in the mirror is actually better than what you think it is. Oh, yes. So actually it means like instead of listening to your mind. Yeah listen to your, your heart because yeah. you, and open your heart to, to get com connected to, to get the help of people yeah because when you when you when you you strong or you you project that you're so strong nobody is going to no. try to come and help you because they say oh this this person is so strong so yeah it's again showing vulnerability and and uh, and uh, I think maybe one day because working in your work with Apple, um, I love that subject, but maybe one day we're going to have another interview talking about all these absolutely all these young people who are so desperate and and sick and it, it, it's very sad. So, at the end of my interview, as you were, I always ask, what is uh, after what you've been through? Now we're talking about you. Uh, what is the message you would like to leave? people listen to us? I would tell everyone, you were mentioning being authentic before, is to be authentic with your own self. And by being authentic, you'll find strength in that. Mm -hmm. And you'll let others, the, the ones that really deserve to be next to you, to stand next to you. Because they will help move you along. And then in return, you will help them move along as well. And there's nothing that feels better than that. So maybe that's what I would say. Thank you very much. So Thank again, you. as we say, it's always about being authentic, real, open heart. And when you open, you will always connect with human, with people. So thank you. And if you have any question, and you have any question, the thing you want to know, ask or write, please write to us or contact us. Ciao.